We're going to be talking about uh, machine learning, data sets and humanities of search. And we're hoping to have a bit of a discussion and get some ideas from you uh, about how and where JISC might be able to support these activities, uh, either with practical work that, that we might undertake or in the way that we provide support out to the community. So JISC used to be a funding body and in the past uh, we would award grants to organizations to undertake research and development and implementation projects that's no longer our mission uh, uh, our, our focus now is much more on providing digital products and services however the, the current gist strategy does recognize that universities and colleges in the uk want gist to use its convening power uh, and its unique position to help drive forward agendas and to help the sector act strategically and to facilitate knowledge exchange uh, and to support organizations in recognizing and adopting good good and best practice so so that's what we'd like to do in the area of machine learning uh, and machine actionable data having said that it's worth noting and, and others at this conference have said it uh, over the course of the last few days that AI and machine learning is currently being referenced everywhere uh, across education and cultural heritage. Uh, uh, as part of the exploratory work that, that PLEASA um, has been doing, we'll be hearing from him shortly, um, a horizon scan of this topic suggests that, suggests that there are at least 32 uh, UK and international organisations or initiatives that are looking at AI and ML in the education space. Which makes the question that we want to discuss today even more pertinent to where is it that JISC can operate so that we ensure that we are not duplicating effort or creating even more complexity. And just to note actually that that horizon scan exercise excluded all the commercial companies that are operating in the AI space and who are developing products or services for educational use, so of which there are many of course. So uh, machine learning is going to be the focus of this session, but we recognize there are other aspects to AI. Uh, JISC actually has its own national center for AI in tertiary education. But at the moment, they're primarily looking at enterprise level applications and how technology can help institutions improve services to students and other stakeholders. They are practically looking at the use of bots or chatbots, i.e. You know, computer programs that simulate human conversation through voice commands or text chats or both. Uh, so humanities data sets and collections as actionable data, the, the sorts of things that uh, we believe the DC, DC community is interested in, it, it's not really on their radar at the moment. So, so that's why the teams that I'm responsible for in JISC are looking into this topic area. We work in the Digital Resources Directorate uh, at JISC, and more specifically in the area of content uh, and discovery. And we provide services such as Archives Hub, uh, Library Hub, and Historical Texts and Journal Archives. And those services, they handle large amounts of metadata and content. So we are quite well placed to look at that data and explore how we might make resources more discoverable or to what extent those descriptions are culturally representative diverse and inclusive and colleagues working on the uh, archives hub are actively engaged in some work uh, right now and are working collaboratively on one of the ahrc funded tank projects um, i'm not quite sure whether uh, jane or adrian uh, is on the call uh, so but we might be able to hear a bit more about that when we get to q a part of the discussion uh, but building on that practical work, we want to understand more generally how these technologies can be employed most usefully for those undertaking humanities research, teaching or learning. Our focus at the moment is to support just higher education members, um, but obviously whatever we find out and whatever help and support we can provide, it might, it might easily be applicable to and beneficial for other sectors as well, including FE, of course. So, so this session is really about developing a conversation. We'd like to know what you think about these technologies and their application to humanities research and teaching in relation to archival and library collections, and especially in relation to making more data available. Well, one question we might consider through the session uh, is 
what do we need to do if we want to develop useful data sets in a practical way for processing by machines and do we want to develop what is sometimes referred to as ground truth sets and um, Peter might unpack that uh, concept a bit more for us and we're of course aware that ethics are central to the uptake of machine learning methodologies in education and in memory institutions and uh, those concerns and how they affect the design of uh, archive and library infrastructures have got to underpin all the discussions that we have and I'm sure we'll return to that topic as part of the Q&A. Uh, but right now I'm going to hand over to Peter and uh, over to you. Thanks very much Neil. Um, yeah, so I'm Peter Finlay, uh, I'm Digital Portfolio Manager in Neil's team in JISC. Um, I'm going to be sharing some slides with you. Uh, I'm a 50-ish old year old male, um, white male, and I have a quite a graying beard with a bushy moustache and, and uh, some very uh, short cropped hair. I wear glasses. I'm wearing a, a blue uh, shirt with a it's like pink uh, check and uh, some blue trousers. And I'm sitting in South London and it's quite warm. Um, so hopefully. Uh, I, I, I won't uh, melt away. Uh, so I'll now share my uh, screen with you in the usual manner. And put it into presentation mode. Sometimes that takes a moment. So as usual, I hope for, hopefully everyone can see that. Yeah, um, that was good. Good, good. Okay, so, okay, machine learning data sets and humanities research. Um, the question, one of the questions that I was uh, given to consider, you know, what is, uh, do people need uh, uh, data sets for, uh, to, to aid their work uh, through uh, the new, new technologies of AI and the subset machine learning? Um, and through uh, through sort of uh, research and, and 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 considerable amount of reading and and and, and learning, um, I I think that what we're looking at really is uh, is ex explainability or an explainable machine learning um, data set development. Um, now, whether that's right or not is a question. So I suppose that's that's what we're here for, really, to try and determine that. But I think that's the kind of overarching. Uh, so people want to know uh, more about these technologies, I think is probably the, our ground truth. Um, so I was thinking I was thinking about there's a lot of there's a lot of commentary about uh, concerns about these technologies and and people are quite concerned about ethical aspects. Um, so uh, it was interesting to uh, come across this uh, um, blog post uh, by uh, Clifford Lynch, who's the executive director of CNI in the States, um, and, and, and he suggests that uh, memory organizations can be develop skills and workflows um, to help them in, in, the, in this domain, um, and, and that it's really about trying to improve the processing uh, and access to digital collections, which has been kind of hampered in many ways, and certainly in terms of description, in, in, uh, because of shortage of labour. Um, so, and one of the things that obviously concerns people is that it will take away labour. But uh, I think the suggestion here is is that these technologies help humans, and that we should utilise them in that way. Uh, but there are, of course, consequences uh, to all these kinds of decisions. And I suspect that one of the consequences, you know, you, you may have to accept uh, 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 that there will be uh, uh, emerging issues of, of quality and consistency um, and that that may, that may fall short of what we expect uh, as humans. But I think if we think of these things as aids and tools, then, then perhaps that, that might be a way forward. An interesting blog post, incidentally. Um, link at the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, so why are we here today? Well, I think there's a, a, um, an increasing awareness um, that we, we need um, to have, have our collections ready for computational use. Uh, there's increasing demand that, 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 that this should be so. And of course, uh, Google demands it because Google <laughs> essentially is a, a big AI engine. 
and it's demanding uh, all the time uh, that we make our our material uh, available to uh, the behemoth uh, so that people can find them and of course that so often is still the first place that people go whether they be uh, students or uh, academics or, or researchers uh, that's often the first the starting point and we, we really need to bear that in mind and of course Google has done a lot of work in this domain and is using algorithms extensively and has recently developed new technologies um, which will enhance their capability uh, to provide more refined results but I, we have questions about those refined results what, do that, what does that actually mean um, so that's that's one of the considerations uh, questions about how we can actually utilize explainable machine learning techniques to help us improve both ac providing access to the collections but also those who want to work with them so the, the, the academic work um, and how can we ensure that our data is ready uh, for machine actionable collection use and access and we've, we've often spoken about collections as data but increasingly that is becoming uh, important um, so we, you know we still have lots of stuff sitting on shelves and that that's uh, all to the good uh, and important in itself but there is of course increasing drive to make uh, material uh, into data um, that can be consumed by machines also by humans uh, so we, we started off really with doing a kind of horizon scan, and it was interesting to know that there are 32 organizations and counting uh, in, engaged in this space, uh, as Neil said. Uh, and um, this question there about, well, do we need another one to be doing uh, doing this this stuff? Uh, and if if so, what what exactly should it is, should be focused on? Um, a few of those were state size, and there were some a couple of big reports that came from from from, from OCLC and, and and also from the Library of Congress, which uh, I think most many people who are interested in this topic will be familiar with. Uh, and they 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 have lots of calls to actions, and 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 part of what we're doing is responding to that call to action as one of the institutions that might do something in this space. Um, I thought it'd be useful just to. Briefly mentioned for those people who are not so familiar with this space, basic types of machine learning. Um, we've got the in in the in the text domain. We have the supervised uh, and the and uh, um, uh, uh, approach, which basically requires you to provide some form of labeling of the input data, uh, so that some kind of classificate pre classification of the data, and then ultimately that that out outputs uh you know the machine then learns to classify that data further um so so we call that supervised and that's i suppose you might say the humans are more in the loop there and and again those reports talk a lot about human in the loop uh, activity in this domain um and then there's the unsupervised uh where where the un, where there's essentially a, a whole set of unclassified data and we build a system uh or Increasingly, we also buy those off the shelf, those black boxes potentially from big providers, um, and they they take certain actions based on the algorithms which have been developed, and they will then do that uh, classification work uh, in an unsupervised manner. And there's a lot of questions, of course, about that. But there's questions about both both sets, and of course, also the, there's uh, the whole domain of computer vision, uh, which is so the, the big domains, I suppose, are the text analysis. And then there's the computer vision uh, side of uh, 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 which we hear quite a lot about um, because, you know, people are concerned about how things are identified in images and and and, uh, and, and we are concerned about that as well, because, of course, in archives, we're dealing an awful lot with with images and we know uh, that these technologies have been useful in, um, you know, handwriting recognition and uh, those kinds of things and 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 you know so they're all the all of these things have concerns uh, wrapped around them um in terms of our work we we're sort of engaged in developing a, a, what we call a thought leadership uh a framework i think thought sharing framework might be might be a useful uh label for it but it's really about how do we work with our members to try and uh, explore some of these kinds of issues so i think in this you know, in this project, and and it follow a kind of kind of framework of looking at data, uh, looking at the subject matter, evaluating uh, what we can do with that data. Do we do we clean it, uh, and then what steps do we need to take to make it machine actionable? And bearing in mind things like standards like the FAIR principles, 
uh, and also thinking about uh, Tom Pavilla's uh, uh, notions of machine actionable collections as a frame. Um, and it's really about bringing people together. So today is part of, of that, of that uh, activity. So we're interested in finding people who are, have questions, so humanists with questions, librarians and archivists, of course, with collections who want to put them in the game, uh, or also looking at our own data availability, uh, which uh, Neil mentioned, uh, and how can we work together uh, to to develop explainable and of course explainability is really for humans so it's really that is really about people and that's a you know it's an exploring uh, process that we that we will go through so there's an understanding process a basic understanding of what we're doing and there's a kind of exploration uh, together uh, and and an and engagement then following from that so you know building some kind of community of practice or community of interest um, gathering more requirements, uh, what is it that we really we really need and want and what's, what would be most useful. Uh, we talked a lot about the idea of mapping the ethics to pipelines, so making those ethical considerations very practically based uh, and trying to understand more in terms of practice, what, what do you have to consider when you want to make, uh, you know, an, eth an ethical, uh, take an ethical approach. So it's an overarching theme to the whole piece, really. Um, and then we want to be able to demonstrate and show people what explainable machine learning actually looks like. And that's kind of explore and decide phase. And then uh, from that, I think there will be outputs like things like guidance, practical advice, guides, case studies, workflows, pipelines, reports, you know, and, and, and also contributions as GISP. Of course, we contribute to, to sector policy. Uh, you know, just um, Neil mentioned the tank program and we're all we're kind of engaged with that. And we obviously we talk to other funding bodies. And, you know, so we're interested in, in exploring those things from. But I suppose with our members are kind of where we where we focus. Um, so um, to do all of that. We also want to, you know, set the work up in the right way. So we're setting up a task and finish group to help us uh, make some of the decisions around all of this. I'll say something more about that in a moment. Um, so what's the, what's the objective of the, of, the, of the project, if you want to call it that? Um, I, I tend to think of these things more as extended initiatives because they may not have a defined start and end uh, points. Um, you know, some parts may, but uh, at the moment we're still at really very much in that explore phase. So we don't necessarily know what the, uh, where, where we'll wind up. Um, so what's it really about? Well, it's about trying to, trying to get, move away from this notion of, of that things go into a black box and they come out the other and we don't know why, what, what, what's, what's the impact of, of, of doing those, those things. We need to understand more about that. And humans obviously have to be right in the, in the loop. Um, and so it's really take, taking a look at these things through the lenses of academics and researchers. So bringing them together, together with collection providers um, to, you know, work on, on practical examples of explainable ML in research, libraries and archives, and to describe that essentially and what and take steps uh, you know, in response to what we learn. Um, and the, that agenda, as I said, is to be defined by a task of finish group. I mean, I've already been speaking to some people and I've interviewed various people who have come, you know, come across. We, we often work with people who are engaged in district humanities research and activity, and we are um, plumbed into some of those networks. So we've been talking to people about some of this already. But we want to take those conversations further and, and we hope that people will want to join a group. And it may, it may be initially, a, a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, um, defined group, but I, I hope also that we might develop a kind of, you know, sort of panel approach so that we can talk, have conversations ongoing with people and that people can come in and out of the conversation, which I think is what community development really is about. Um, so, and who's it, who's it for, who cares about it? Well, it's really, I think we're focusing kind of on the non-specialist academics. So I mentioned people involved in digital humanities research, but of course they're much more specialist, you know, using computational approaches, but there's lots of people who are interested in those things, but don't necessarily know where to start. So that's kind of where I think we might focus because there's, there's big organizations like Turing that are doing things at quite, you know, uh, significant or high level. So where can we fit so that we can do things that are, are useful to su support and, and, and supplement that work? Um, so it's really understanding what the humanists uh, want, uh, people working in humanities want from these, th these technologies, 
um, and, and, and it's really, you know, to also get beyond some of the, the complex language and make things more digestible. Uh, and again, in terms of transparency, that might help. Um, but also we're very aware that there's a lot of uh, work going on to actually embed some of these technologies in library systems. So when you start conducting research, you might already be interacting. Some, some commercial companies are already working with or vendors of library systems or work, are working with other commercial companies to bring AI uh, technologies to bear on search, um, it, you know, when you search the catalog. So that, that's kind of quite impactful potentially. So it'd be good to understand more about that. Um, and of course, Library, librarians and arch archivists in, in the content team, that's who we have tended to work with. Uh, they're our constituents, I suppose, or constituents. And uh, they have, uh, you know, they're very keen to ensure data integrity and, and the fair principles. So I've put a link into them if you don't know what they are. Um, but they're, they're really about trying to um, think about the data that you put out into the environment and its cons consumption by machines. Um, and, and so that's that's a big consideration, you know, increasingly it's machines who who will come to 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 your uh, to a library and, 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 and ask questions of the data that that's held in your systems. So we need to consider that. Um, so, you know, more questions that the uh, task and finish group might want to consider is, you know, so what is responsible uh, machine learning in research libraries and archives. Um, what's already been done? So I've already been looking at some things, but there's lots of statements, declarations, and toolkits already out there. I and mean, what can we do to bring some of those things perhaps together and make them more useful? Is that something that, that we might do? Um, and 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 who do we do that with, and and who for? Uh, so that some of those things still need to be determined. Uh, as I said, focus on ethical issues that will obviously be very important. Um, what's that about? Is it about developing standards or statements of values? Again, it needs to be practically based and thinking about real data. Uh, how do we document and evaluate all these things and take actions to make that uh, machine learning more transparent? And I think that word, underpin that word more or un underline it. Uh, I was talking to a, a colleague the other day who was suggesting that it's really about more transparency because some things are very transparent, some, some things are not at all. Um, and we might not never get to perfect transparency, of course, uh, it's worth bearing in mind. Um, should point uh, to uh, got a link to uh, the Archives Hub blog, and there's been some excellent articles written by the team on machine learning uh, in relating to archives and, and, and work that's being undertaken by that team with, with uh, just some just members. Uh, I, I really would point to those articles. I think they're really, really good summaries of, of important matters. Um, Further questions uh, is around access to data in the first place. So what do good machine actionable collections actually look like? And that's defined in the OCLC report. Again, a link's at the bottom there. Responsible operations is a, a, a very worthwhile read, I think. Um, and how can we support uh, you know, creation and wider access to those kinds of collections? Um, and thinking about, well, I think I already alluded to this, machines and algorithms as patrons as I say you know increasingly uh, machines will come to your to your uh, data through your catalogs and your systems um, and what are the use cases for, for that uh, do we how can we consider those uh, and you know how can we support uh, the creation and reuse of domain specific training data sets or ground truth sets or is that something that we should be doing now some some of the literature says yes that is a very useful activity but quite often it seems that the ground truth sets develop through lots of processing and lots of processes going on through projects or project funding. Question is, can you create those things as you know ready state things that you provide out in you know on a platform or in an environment? Is that is that a, a, an approach that you can take, or does it rely on having done lots of project work to get a ground truth set out that can then be shared on with uh, with other uh, projects? Perhaps questions again. Um, so moving on, final slide on questions to consider. Uh, lots of questions around the the uh, the library infrastructure or library and archival infrastructure. Sorry, I should have put archival in there that can su support this this kind of work. And 
you know, we hear a lot about, about uh, infrastructure, but what do we really mean by that? And so what, questions again, what is the role of the library and collection provider? Um, and how can they work more, more readily with uh, researchers and across disciplines as well? I think it's increasingly important to, to, to consider that, particularly, you know, bringing, bringing also people in, specialists in, like people who have specialisms in machine learning, computer science and so forth. How do you bring those together in effective ways with people who have, you know, questions in their own research? Um, Questions for us about whether we should uh, do some um, small grant funded challenges to explore uh, the embedding of machine learning results in discovery interfaces as an example, could be other things. And what kinds of skills and expertise and, uh, need to be developed to help people to uh, both understand these things more readily, but also potentially impact them, influence them, ask questions about them, those sorts of things. Of course, JISC is not, as I said, it's not the only agency. SILIP, it's a very good report, uh, which I probably should have put a link into, sorry. Uh, look, look it up. Um, Andrew Gray wrote, wrote a report for SILIP, which is excellent. Uh, it focuses very much on the skills uh, piece. Um, so the question about whether or not we, we spend so much time on, on that, but we may. Um, and then what, well, you know, kind of outputs, can we develop sample pipe, pipelines, workflows, um, implementation toolkits, vendor guidelines? These are the kinds of things that JISC, you know, in our thought leadership activity, that's what we try to do. We try to provide these things both to our own, own sort of uh, constituents, but also to the, to the wider world, you know. Uh, so usually we try to make them open. Um, and so in terms of the discussion right now, uh people on the call uh maybe some some questions to consider you know that we hopefully can can try to answer a little bit you know how can we ensure that data is ready for machine actionable collection use and access thinking of collections as ground truth data uh how can we utilize machine learning techniques to help us improve access to collections in the first place uh, or, or the discovery of, of collections and perhaps access to collections. Uh, and what is currently not being focused on uh, if, uh, if higher education institutions, and Paul, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Neil mentioned the fact that we also uh, work with further education, but in, in this instance, we're, we're focusing on, on uh, higher education institutions. So what, what's currently not being focused on? Uh, if HEIs are to make best use of these technologies, you know, and what, where, where can we take action that's useful? Um, and I think, hopefully that was not too garbled. Um, I think I've kind of come to the end of uh, what I wanted to say, and I'm hopeful that uh, you can either put on your camera and join the conversation. It's always nice to see people. I know that can be a bit daunting, but, but why not live dangerously? Um, or just put the questions in the Q&A. And that also, of course, putting the questions in the Q&A does help us also to have a record of them so that we can consider them if we can't answer it all now. Or sometimes people want to ask questions uh, that, you know, we might have to come back to people for. And you can always contact either Neil or I, um, uh, you know, if you want to get in, involved or you're interested in this work or you have more questions that we can't answer today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're around in the environment. So uh, get in touch. And uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. And please uh, give us some, some hard questions because we'll, 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 we'll know the not, answer. Not too hard, not too hard. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, thanks very much. I should stop sharing now. So yeah. uh, it says pause share there. I want to stop sharing. So um, if people do want to actually put their camera on and, um, and, okay. and talk, uh, and or talk, you don't need to put your camera on, you could just, you know, have your audio on. Um, then if you put your hand up, then um, our colleague George will be able to transfer you into, or, or turn you into a panellist, and then you can turn your camera on. I think that's the way it goes. Um, but of course, uh, you can just also um, put stuff in, in the Q&A screen, or indeed the chat, which uh, Julian has, has done. Um, in fact, there was a there was a, a request that just came to host and panelists about a link for the SILIP work, please. She says, uh, you must refer to some SILIP work, Peter. Sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said. You must have, uh, did you refer to some work that SILIP had done? 
Yes, which yeah. is looking at, skill, at the skills piece. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I could try and see if I can find that report and I'll post it in the... Is that the question? Sorry. Uh, she, uh, Gillian was just asking whether we could make the link available. And yeah, I'll, I shall do my best to go and find it now. We can, we can do that, yes. Um, but, um, she's uh, put something else in there as well. Um, so... Um, it's a comment. It's uh, she's, she says buy-in from managers to assist support uh, is sometimes a challenge, and when budgets are so constrained, if the archives IT system is controlled by the HE institution, it can be a challenge to get them on board too if they're not familiar with the archive library-specific programs. Yes, something we're very familiar with, isn't it? Neil? This is this is so true. Um... I mean, quite often when, when we start off this work, we, we, will, we will start off with, uh, you know, a sort of shaping activity, but then that may then result in uh, further activity, which may have some small amounts of funding attached to it. Um, you know, uh, we, we've, we've done some work in the past where we did uh, pay some institutions to partake in a, in a, 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 a project, um, you know, because they were providing us with data and they were providing us with lots of insights and so forth. And it was it just helped to oil the wheels. But um, I mean, at the moment, I think we're not quite at that stage where we've got a defined, um, you know, a defined program of work. Uh, so I think that, you know, we, we, we would consider those things. We, we do consider those things. <laughs> Usually if people come to, to events as over just we help with, uh, uh, you know, paying expenses and things like that. We can also help people making the case, you know, and explain what we're trying to do. Um, I mean, uh, your experience, Neil, you've been, you've been around the block with, with those sorts of things for a long time as well. Mm. Yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah. I mean, going back to the idea of, you know, trying to um, get IT departments on board. I mean, I think it's, uh, it, it's certainly been the case in you know, digital preservation systems, but um, in uh, other areas as well, and trying to get that internal conversation, um, you know, in the right place and, and with the right kinds of advocacy and, and furnishing people with the right kinds of information that they can, you know, have those internal conversations. Extremely important. Um, uh, Jane has just uh, joined us uh, as a as panelist, which is great. Uh, thank you very much, Jane, for, for popping up. And um, yeah, I, I, we've, Hi, Jane. we've referenced the uh, the tank work that you're doing. Would you like to just tell folks uh, a little bit more about that and, and perhaps you know some of the labs work? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, in the Archives Hub team, we've got a couple of projects that we're um, one that we're leading and one that we're involved with that both. Um, uh, are about, to a certain extent, machine learning. So um, the ACRC, um, a AHRC even, um, funded tank project that we're involved with, which is led by um, University of the Arts London. Um, the main area that's looking at in terms of machine learning is developing uh, a, a tool that can um, uncover kind of bias and issues with cataloging. Um, so that's something that, that UAL, that their, their creative computing center are actually going to be developing and we're going to be working with them and we can obviously provide data from all of the archives hub contributors and provide some of our kind of expertise and, and knowledge of the archives domain. So what I'm hoping is at some point those that contribute to the archives hub will have access to this tool as a kind of beta tool and, and, and I guess we'll see what we find with that, that 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 um project has only just started and that's a three-year very big kind of project um and then we're doing our own um somewhat ambitious um labs project archives hub labs project which actually involves both triple if for images and machine learning because we thought we'd um make our plate really full um, so the machine learning side of that we have uh, an aws certified machine learning expert working with us and it's it's a very open-ended exploratory project so we're working with I think it's about eight of our contributors now so a number of universities and some smaller institutions with their um, content and data and it's it's really it's kind of seeing what we find in all honesty so um, and seeing what the problems are as we go along so 
it's been an interesting process. Even kind of getting the large quantities of data has been somewhat problematic with some of them. So <laughs> that, that was a challenge to begin with. Kind of getting the data, how the data is labeled, how we can identify it, matching up images with archive descriptions, which is different in every single institution and can be difficult. And then uh, we'll be moving through to testing out some machine learning tools. We're mainly using the AWS, the Amazon cloud um, tools. So things like you know text and image recognition, um, all these various tools. And, and we're gonna kind of see what we get. Um, the last thing that I would say on that before I hand back is, um, I think I've said this a little bit in the blog, but it's been kind of interesting because the out of the box machine learning tools tend to be set up for, um, how can I put it? Kind of for the present day, if you like, for the modern world. As in, when you think of archives, for example, we have some images of 1940s and 50s um, household kind of furniture and items as part of the design archive. Well, machine learning tools don't recognize the cooker and the fridge and the whatever. Um, they, they say um, this cooker is a fridge or whatever, you know. Um, so we're quite interested in that whole area of whether GISC has a role to play in, in, in training algorithms to recognize kind of more historical items and artifacts and the sorts of things that you come across within archives. So I'll just leave it there. Um, hopefully that gives you some idea. Do have a look at the blog. The blog is very, we're really, really trying to be honest about the problems and issues and take you through it step by step with what we're doing in the blog. So it's worth having a look at that if you're interested. Great. Certainly, I picked up a lot of information from the blog, uh, Jane. So um, it's always good, good to have a look at, actually, because it, it's obviously very much focused on the collect on collections and arch archives very specifically. And I think there's not many things that are maybe quite as focused as that on those things. So that's really what I found very valuable about it. Thinking about things like you said, identifying or not being able to identify the things that are important to people who are doing archival research, which is quite different from people who kind of do other things like facial recognition or whatever, uh, which may be important to archives. But uh, yeah, certainly the blog. Well, again, facial recognition. I mean, that's something we 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 haven't prioritised that at the moment. We're prioritising more. We're thinking of looking at text in images, particularly for a lot of archives where you have kind of posters and, and, and things like that. Facial recognition, we may have the same kinds of issues, I think, with older kind of black and white photographs. You know, again, uh, the, 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 the tools aren't necessarily trained on our kind of materials. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a point just made by Melinda in the chat. That's a really fascinating point about historical objects not being recognised. Does that apply also around personal signifiers? Uni yeah, like uni yeah, uniforms, Melinda. That, that, um, Melinda, sorry, that, that, that's an interesting social status. Well, well, quite probably. I mean, probably. We, we've only just started on this, and I do think this is a particular area that we want to explore. So for example, as I said, with the, um, with the, 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 the kitchens, the 1940s, the uh, kitchen photographs we've got, because quite a lot of them are well labeled, um, what we'd like to try and do, and this is, this is where it's quite difficult, and this is why you need a lot of data, and it's why individual institutions might struggle, because you need the quantity of data to say, right, we've got some well labeled photographs here, so we can feed that in, and then over here, we've got some that um, are, are similar and um, from a similar era, but they aren't labeled. And now we've done a bit of training of the algorithm. You know, what can we get? Can we get improved outputs? So that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. But yes, it could be the same thing with, with anything like that. In fact, it'd be interesting to see. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, please stick around, Jane, and just, you know, be part of the panel still. Um, because you know, I think that point about individual institutions, it's um, uh, we've got a, uh, another comment from Julian there. Sometimes it can help to have an expert in the meetings, and I think I think Julian, you might be referring to those kinds of meetings we were talking about in terms of those internal meetings to try and get things organised uh, on the ground locally. Um, that, that's an interesting question, and one thing that I would say is this is hard. <laughs> it's quite it's quite hard. Like we've got somebody that that 
you know, is, is certified. Uh, and, you know, we, we all know this when you actually come down. Uh, certified to... in terms of AWS, rather than certified yes. in terms of uh, <laughs> sanity. Yeah. Okay, well, possibly, possibly. But, <laughs> yeah. so, so you can have somebody that's, that's kind of done the exam, but, but the, the practical reality, we're coming across issues that just aren't, we didn't necessarily expect, you know, so you need quite a lot of technical knowledge. So um, I think that's an interesting idea, borrowing somebody <laughs> with a bit of expertise, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's something that we could, you know, discuss in terms of our interventions and, you know, this is what we kind of want to get to in terms of shaping uh, JISC's activity and how, how we support and, and help. And I think this idea about maturity out there, you know, in institutions, in the sector, Peter, you and I were talking a bit about it yesterday, weren't we? And you mm. had conversations with, with the likes of Ruth Isaacson at Exeter. Um, uh, do you want to share that, that, that kind of conversation that you had with him? Well, the maturity of, of, of institutions in terms yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, so, so, so well, yeah, he, he, I mean, he, you know, not, not, to, not to quote him directly, but we were talking about, you know, what is the use of web in, in so often in, in research uh, or in acti academic activity? So often it's still kind of uh, as a substitute for paper. So reading documents, uh, individual documents, which there's nothing wrong with, of course. Um, but he was suggesting, you know, that so much more use could be used of computational analysis to help um, with, with various tasks in the in you know in the research pipeline um but uh you know often people don't have the time that's in the, you know so people are time poor so having time to engage with new techniques and new ways of doing things can be it can be an issue having expertise to hand sometimes the language as i said language can be daunting or stuff is in all kinds of different places you know, sometimes getting in touch with specialists can, in itself can be daunting, you know, so if, you, if you're going to talk to a specialist, can you ask them the right questions that, you, you know, uh, you know if, if you get in touch with Turing, you're going to probably meet some quite uh, uh, expert people. Sometimes people might not feel confidence that they can, that they can do that, you know, to, because they might have some questions, but they might not feel they're at the level to, although, you know, whenever I've spoken to Turing, actually, they're very open and, and helpful uh, people uh, and explain very well uh, a lot of the uh, issues and are very well aware of those things because it's, how it's, the, it's the national centre. Um, but, you know, can are there things that we can do in terms of the, in, the interpretation or the bringing people together to consider those kinds of things and maybe try to just shift the ground a little bit so that, you know, computational approaches become a bit more prevalent, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a revolution. I mean, there's kind of a revolution going on all around as a tech, but mm. you know, it's really about getting people to engage with these things at a level that they feel comfortable with and then developing those, again, it's I suppose developing skills, knowledge and, uh, and, and, and contacts and those sorts of things, which I think is quite good at trying to bring people together around topics like this. And blogs, I mean, I think, you know, Jane, again, I, I, I think the blog just provides such a useful, set of insights into some of the work that you're doing and so documenting those things i think is you know mm. is is essential yeah that, that makes all that makes the difference you're that you're documenting something pra practical that you're doing we have to design these uh, these touch points uh, uh, in, in ways that uh, that make sense to to institutions at the right level i mean we've got a um question come in in the chat but i just say that you know it seems to me that, that one of the ways that we can you know, foster that, that discussion is, is around this idea about, you, in your presentation, Peter, you put humanists with questions and, and the idea of you know, starting from the research question seems to me to be a, a, a rich way forward and rather than say, okay, we've got all this data, what do we do with it? It's if you come at it from the other side and say, okay, well, who, who's got questions and let's identify the, the, the data sets or the subsets of data that would actually be you know, pertinent or relevant to helping that person you know, progress those research questions um, is, is presumably a, a good way forward. Yeah, make, make, making it, de yeah, so de demonstrating things and then documenting things so you can move to the next stage really and, and, and have a documentation of what's, what's occurred. And, and trying to answer the question around how do you 
uh, get around, around some of these compli complications of terminology. Uh, I mean, the little diagram I showed about the two two main types is, you know, it's probably as it stands not that useful because in it's it's still using some of the, te the terminology. But can we explain those things more readily in a way that people feel then comfortable with to be able to talk about? I think in the first place. Um, you know, can it, uh, what kind of descriptions can you make? But again, I think based on practice, and again going back to the archive hub approach of uh, actually doing stuff mm. with data which relates to collections. Um, yeah, I, I think in terms of um, terminology, I mean, of course, that's always a, a difficult question, isn't it? And, and there's d domain specific terminology and technical terminology that can be difficult. I, I, I guess what I'd say is, is I, I'd like to think that this can be one of the strengths of, of, of GISC and certainly within our project. You know, I'm, I'm an archivist and I'm writing blogs. I'm trying to write blogs for a kind of archival audience, you know, a non-technical audience, people that maybe have an understanding of, of archives, but, but, but they won't you know, have a knowledge of, have, have kind of technical knowledge, let alone knowledge of specific machine learning. So I think with, with so many of these things, you kind of need the, the technical people that I sit in meetings with and, and try to follow and understand. And then I try to kind of take that and, and write that in a way that I think people will understand. I usually run the blog posts back past the more technical people and they'll say, oh, this is slightly wrong or right. But you know, it's it's it's. I, I think maybe that intermediary role is is increasingly important mm. in the world that that we're now in. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that that's one way that we can address the problems with terminology. No, no, I think I think actually coming at it with a slight bit of ignorance to start with actually is actually useful because you you've got the questions yourself. Yes. And then over time, being able to frame those so you can ask someone, you know, technical person, uh, you know, we could person, person in the archives have team and I passed blog, a blog post I wanted to do that way. And, 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 and it's very helpful to have that conversation and to get a bit of critique. And that then led me to a better, a slightly better understanding again. And then sort of so it's that interpretation, really. And I think trying to. Uh, there's a question here about humanists are very much trained to imagine research questions that are reasonable within the scope of their own discipline. Uh, Pilar is, is, is saying that. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, Pilar, but uh, that, that, I think that's so true. You know, people are in their domain and, they're, and they're, they're interested in that domain, but then they may have a recognition that there are things that could, could be useful but then asking the right questions to get to that useful part to them, to their own practice, I think is a, is, is a, is that can be really tough actually. Yeah. I, I, I just, sorry, Peter, just, just to go back to um, also the question about beyond uh, how can you help people imagine using these technologies beyond the, the paper thinking. So I think if I'm understanding that correctly, just to say one of the things we're going to be doing on this project is to release our technical outputs um, on GitHub. And what I very much hope we'll do again is provide not just the kind of, here are the outputs on GitHub, which, which I find a little bit impenetrable myself, but, but yeah. with some kind of documentation and help and, and, and that the blog will lead up to, to that. Um, so obviously that, could be a good starting point for some people you know if we've already done some work with a number of archives and we can release some some of our outputs in that way for people to maybe take them on and reuse them indeed yeah there are some other initiatives i'm sorry i, I, I won't immediately i've got a terrible memory for things but i won't immediately be able to say what it is but there is an initiative which is doing some of that actually is is trying to provide documentation on github to explain <laughs> You know, to explain the processes that a project has gone through and why the, the outputs that are there on GitHub are useful and what they're useful for. So I think that, you know, those quite often when people are think involved in technical activities, their documentation can be tricky. Um, so trying to find mechanisms to help people generate documentation and, and ex explain things uh, and then trying again to abstract up a bit, maybe a level so that people can then drill down again. 
just those kind of approaches to is really communication, I suppose, really around these things. Because I think so much technology is like is like that. that if you know, t- that if you um, if you try if you try to make a, 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 a you know some some easy answers that that's probably not it you've got to base it on some of the practice and then try to take make easier answers from that practice and i think that's what so much what the work that we want to engage in is about is trying to, to d- develop it around the, the actual practical things and then describe those in an effective manner that ala- enable people to gain access i suppose or mm. take, take those things up yeah. Whether whether or not they are humanists who are very much in their own uh, domain, and but we've got to remember, of course, that humanists who, who are in their own domain have started to go out and use machines to help. Mm. We call them. I'm, I'm interested. Digital in humi- the, humanists, but what does that you know? I'm, I'm interested in the motivations for you know for people to um, go above and beyond um, you know their their usual practice or, or to think creatively uh, kind of about using machine actionable data. Um, and the kind of and the richness and, and the rewards one might get. I mean, I, when you were talking earlier, Peter, about you know putting humans in the loop and the, the supervised machine learning, when I started thinking about this area some time back, I, I said to to our boss uh, Liam you know, about these these kind of data sets, these big data sets that we might um, pull together that could, might be used you know across the humanities. And and there's you know we've had sort of pushback on that, and we realised that you know generic data sets um, are, probably aren't um, much use. <laughs> Um, but uh, I, we'll, I also got pushback on 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 saying that you know perhaps there's a role for JISC uh, for, for going in and doing some of that in you know, that supervised learning. Um, and uh, you know is, is that is that tedious work? I mean, is there is there a way you know to 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 kind of put these data sets together that that is that is rich and rewarding and the information professionals in our you know in our communities uh, can come towards this work and and really get a lot out of it by you know as well as coming up with these grand truth sets i wonder i think to answer the question about whether it's work, i think there is a fair amount of work in getting these things ready i think that's that's the that's the other thing isn't it having the labor capacity sorry to do the to do this um, well, yeah, but, you know, as I said, um, I think the most efficient way uh, for, for us to end up with machine learning tools that I think will be useful uh, to potentially create better metadata for better discoverability is going to be to be able to train the tools on data that is already well labeled. And in order to do that successfully, I think probably it's going to be need need it's going to need to be done at scale. Um, so we've got a number of um, collections of uh, photographs, university university collection photographs. Mm-hmm. So so those you know are very general. They're kind of collections maybe of the construction of buildings over time and of of, of laboratories and all, all sorts of aspects of a university's life and history. Um, now, if, if a university has a collection like that and they'd like to run machine learning through it and, and see if they can get something because they haven't had the time to, 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 to catalogue it in that detail, well, I think the way that's going to work best is if we've already got tools that have been trained on well-labeled, you know, photographs. So I'm kind of repeating myself in a way, but if you see what I mean, that won't work so well for one university to do that or, or, or whatever. But if we've trained it on a number of um, similar collections, then there's a much better chance that you'll get something good out of it. Um, that's my understanding from, from you know, the, way that, the way that it works. You, you do need to train these algorithms to, to produce something useful. Mm-hmm. It, 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 so in that scenario, you're talking about utilizing collections which are of a similar nature from each from say five institutions or whatever is that what you mean so yeah, sorry yeah. I, mean, I think in the blog you do describe it sorry jane yeah. but i'm yeah. asking now so, for this, so, for this conversation yeah, yeah. I, i'm trying to give a few examples to make it kind of concrete so you know as i said you know a, a, a collection that relates to kind of university buildings and laboratories or a collection that relates to 
you know, kitchen and household objects from uh, the interwar period or whatever it is, um, you can see how you can train the algorithms so that when you get other similar stuff, you, you might get good results. We, we've then got like one of the examples of collections is, is um, images of fossil fish, for example. So uh, we're looking at that and going, okay, um, these, there, there is AI to help you identify fish, <laughs> but not to help you identify old photographs of fossils of fish kind of thing. Um, and that's quite a niche thing. So it's still a case of, well, where do you go with that? You know, because you'd need to kind of train it to, to, to recognize these things. And are there lots of collections of photographs of fossilized fish? <laughs> you know, so that, that those are all the kind of things we're teasing out at the moment. There will be somewhere in the world. I'm well, thinking. yeah, that, that's why I'm saying if you bring them together, yeah. you know, you might be able to do something. Yeah. That, that's our thinking. So, yeah. So we've, uh, with the, Adele has uh, posted a, a link to the Interpares uh, Trust, um, which may be of interest to, to, to folks on this call and, and, and indeed us. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I was wondering whether we, I don't think there's anything in the Q&A box still. So uh, people are hopefully avidly, li avidly listening, if, uh, if not um, asking questions. But um, maybe we should just finish on uh, just on a couple of commentary about um, bias, because I mean, I'm, and, and representation, it's something that's part of your work in on the tank project, isn't it, Jane? And, and Peter, you and I were talking about it yesterday in terms of what, 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 what's what's kind of, uh, recognized in terms of bias these days within um, machine learning and data sets. Uh, Peter, at that point, I think someone made to you about human bias and machine bias. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think the point, you know, it's probably, it's probably not entirely a new point, but, you know, the, the notion that we think if we're dealing with a machine giving us answers to things, we're, we're much more concerned. We're very concerned that is, that, you know, is there bias here? Are these biased results? Most likely they are going to be because the data any data that we conceive of or what we put together has is likely to have, highly likely to have some biases of one kind or another. Uh, so the answer to that probably is yes. But then, of course, if I go and ask an archivist um, a question in an archive, we're probably going to get some biases um, in the in the response. Um, now, that, those biases may not be negative biases, you know, that they have hold biases to, against someone or something, but more that they've got particular domains of knowledge that they uh, have expertise in, that they, they know about, and they might, dire might direct us to those particular things because they're familiar uh, to the exclusion of others. So when, we, when we're thinking about finding aids and, and humans as finding aiders, uh, is there a huge difference? Um, might be a question. Uh, mm. I don't know, Jane, what do you think? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I, it, I mean, it's a fascinating and difficult area, isn't it? I think with the tank project, I think that's going to be interesting because we're working mainly with museums. So we're, we're kind of the main archive, you know, representative, I suppose. And um, in the first workshop that we had with tank, um, they were showing us some, some labels for, you know, art objects and asking which of these was written by machine and which was written by human, you know, that kind of um, fascinating thing. Um, so they're trying to unpick that kind of that kind of area. And again, I think it, it's working with a lot of other people working within a community to try and sort these kind of things out is going to be much more effective than working um, individually. Uh, yeah, as you say, there's always going to be bias of some sort, but actually um, machine algorithms may do a better job of identifying that en masse than, than we're going to do, or than we have the time to do, potentially, of course. Yeah. They can make things explicit as well, that those biases are present, you mm. know, and it holds yeah. the decolonialization agenda, you know, in some ways could be supported by, you know, showing what's missing, the gaps and the, the what's not coming to the, to the top, what's not surfacing, those sorts of things is, yeah. you know, so essential to, to, to trying to, uh, in some way, understand those problems better, uh, you know, in terms of the long term cataloguing, it's gone on the historical record of, you know, the archive and how it was being shaped and those sorts of things. James Baker, um, programming historian and uh, Southampton is uh, very strong on, on some of those topics and uh, yeah. interesting things to say there. 